Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. Today we're going to be taking a journey into the central nervous system uh, to try to understand a little bit more about dementia and about the contributions of three uh, main categories of players here. And so those are the astroglia, the extracellular vesicles, which are of course our, our central topic here, and, um, and the mitochondria. And so we have with us today um, three authors, three co-authors on a recent paper, but they're going to be um, giving us some good background on this area and also talking about their, their research in general. Um, they're led by uh, Kevin Richetin, and he's at the, um, the University of Hospital of, of Lausanne in Switzerland. And um, Kevin, thanks so much for joining and for bringing your team with you. And I'd like to invite you to, um, to share your screen and go ahead and, um, and, and tell us a little bit about these, these three big players in dementia. Thank you so much for this introduction. I'm very happy to, to be here to present our work. So how you explain, we talked today about dementia and extracellular vesicule. So I prefer to start by a short introduction concerning dementia because this term is a sort of umbrella term to describe a set of symptoms associated with cognitive decline, but also with behavioral decline. We don't talk about just Alzheimer's disease. We talk about different sort of pathology that can uh, appear in the aging brain. So of course, the symptom associated with this dementia is very large. We can talk about memory disorder, but not only, we have also change in mood, uh, loss of uh, languages, etc. And behind this uh, disorder, behind this symptom, we can find a neurodegeneration in the brain, in different regions of the brain. And this neurodegeneration is mainly caused by aggregation of some protein in the brain. And in particular, we know different proteins like APP, tau, TDP43, alpha-synuclein, which are very important for the aggregation and for the degeneration. Among them, the tau protein seems to play a very important role because we can observe this protein uh, inclusion and aggregation of this protein in more than 20 tau patties, including Alzheimer's disease, but not only, because we can find also tau in frontotemporal dementia or primary age-related tau patty. So what do we know about this tau protein? It's a major microtubule bonding protein. Uh, so it's a regulation and stabilization of microtubule and consequently is very important for the dynamic and the transport of organelle in the brain. But it's also a very complex protein for many reasons. The first reason is exists an alternative splicing in a, in a cell resulting in the expression of six isoforms. But we call about, we can uh, say that we have two big families, the free air family, when we have free repetitive domain or four air family. And it's a domain responsible to the bonding in the microtubule. Another complexity of this protein is the structure and the folding because these folding are mediated by many sites of phosphorylation. And we have approximately 200 sites of phosphorylation in tau protein. And for unknown reason, during the aging and more during the pathological aging, we have an hyperphosphorylation of these of sites who induce a misfolding of this protein. And this misfolding induce a destabilization of microtubule and induce also tomonomer, oligomer, and tangles formation in the brain. And all together, this destabilization of microtubule, but also the production of oligomer and tangles and use degeneration and dysfunction of the cell. But the equation of tau is also very complex for many reasons, and I try to explain one reason or two reasons. The, the, the question to, to explain um, the, the complexity of this tau pathology, the, the question important is where to accumulate during the different pathology. And as you can see in this uh, beautiful uh, illustration that we know that the tau accumulation of, uh, and tau inclusion in Alzheimer's start in the hippocampus and after we have a progression in different regions, in particular in the cortical region. But it's not the case for other sort of topathy like PSP or PIX disease where the pathology starts in the other region and we have a progression in other region of the brain, in other area of the brain. Another important thing that is during very long time, we believe that tau accumulate only in neurons. But we know now it's not true. Tau accumulate also in glial cells, in different pathology, as you can see here in this table. And sometimes we can also observe only inclusion in astrocytes and not in neurons. 
Just to finish to explain the complexity of this equation, I talk about two isoforms, a free R isoform and four R isoform. And in the context of healthy brain, we have a balance between this free R and four R. But during tauopathies, we can observe an inclusion of free R or four R depending on the pathology. And we can class the pathology based on the fact that we have your four R inclusion, free R inclusion, or mixed inclusion, for example, in the case of Alzheimer's disease. So a few years ago, we decided to investigate the question of the inclusion of TOR in the context of Alzheimer's disease. And for that, we use a post-mortem biobank available in Lausanne. And we decided to investigate the question of number of inclusion in the hippocampus in different populations, but we stratify the population based on the fact that we have or not inclusion of abeta and inclusion of TOR in this region. And very interestingly, concerning the free ARTO, we observe that during the progression of the pathology, meaning during the period where we have just TO hyperphosphorylation in this region, or TO plus abeta, we observe a clear progression of the inclusion of TO in this, uh, in this population and in, in the different population of cells. We don't observe the same pattern for the 4R, and very interestingly again, we observe that this TO 4R increase in the beginning of the pathology, and after we have exactly the same level for the, for the control. After that, we decided to develop an immunochemistry against astrocytes and against tau 3R and 4R, and we quantify the number of inclusion in astrocytes, uh, as you can see here, for 3R inclusion in astrocytes or in 4R inclusion. And again, we observe a clear progression of tau 3R in astrocytes, but it's not the case for, for, for the 4R, suggesting that this inclusion of tau um, come from one region or one subset or uh, population. So how we can explain this origin of TO in astrocytes? Because as I explained in a control condition, we have no TO in astrocytes. So exist different hypotheses to explain the spreading from one protein to another cell, to one cell to another cell. Uh, some, some publication explains that exists a sort of nanotube who can transfer TO protein from one cell to another. Exist also hypotheses about the secretion of free protein and uh, invagination of protein by LRP1, but also many publications recently describe that the exosome or ectosome or mainly extracellular vesicle uh, are important for the secretion and for the, the spreading of TO in different populations. So we emit the hypothesis to explain this difference of 3R and 4R in astrocytes that perhaps the difference between 3R and 4R inclusion is the, is, is the result of different mechanisms from the spreading. So for that, we decided to develop an in vitro model where we use primary culture of neurons and we overexpress by lantiviral vector human to 3R or human to 4R. If you express that, you can induce the pathology in this culture, and we collect the conditional medium of this different population of cells, and we uh, fraction, we, we use different uh, protocol to, to isolate the free protein and to isolate the neuronal derived extracellular vesicle. And in particular, we use ultra centrifugation to separate small vesicle and large vesicle, and we quantify by uh, NTA and electronic microscopy. If we count it, and as we can see, uh, we visualize a small vesicle and large vesicle in our different fraction. And by NTA, we can quantify, we enrich the different fraction for the small vesicle in a small uh, EV. And we enrich also large vesicle uh, in a large uh, fraction. Interestingly, if we use immunogold with antibody against tau, um, you can observe that the toe are located in the vesicle, and in the case also uh, for the small vesicle, but also for the large vesicle, as you can see here. Interestingly, if we quantify the quantity of tau in this different fraction by ELISA, so here it's a result of the ELISA, we observe that the majority of tau are secreted by the free form. So as you can see, the value is very huge, and the majority of the tau are secreted by in free form. And we can find some tau in a small vesicle and large vesicle, but the, the, the quantity is very anecdotic. 
Interestingly, if we applicate this different fraction in another culture of astrocytes, and if we quantify the quantity of tau that we can uptake by astrocytes, we observe the uptake of tau only in a condition of large vesicule. As you can see, six hours after, we, we have a, a clear significant difference between control here. It's a, a EV without expression of tau 3 and 4 in neurons. And after, we observe a decrease of this level of tau in astrocytes. So this value uh, suggests that the tau isoform are shuttled from neurons to astrocytes using mainly the large extracellular vesicle. After that, we decide to investigate the question of the consequences of this uh, uptake of EV. And for that, we use exactly the same strategy, but we equip our astrocyte by a mitotimer. It's a mito mitochondrial sensor, which permit to investigate the morphology of mitochondria, but also the redox states and the, the mobility of the mitochondria. So as you can see here in this movie, we can uh, track the different mitochondria and we, uh, we we monitor the cell after different treatment with a small vesicle, with a large vesicle, sorry, for CFP, so it's a control, 1N3R or 1N4R expression of tau in, in neurons. And we observe a very um, different result depending on the nature of this EV. And in particular, we observe that uh, if we treat with 1N3R EV, we increase the redox states of the mitochondria in astrocyte. And at the opposite, if you treat with a 4R, we reduce the oxidation of the mitochondria in astrocytes. Concerning the morphological change and also the dynamic change, we also observe a clear pattern between 3R and 4R, as you can see here, at 6 hours. And at 24 hours after treatment, we have also a clear difference. And we observe that the EV from neurons accumulating 3R2 have a clear consequences in the functioning of mitochondria in astrocytes. In order to confirm this result in human, and we decide to use post-mortem uh, biobank or fresh frozen brain biobank that we have in Lausanne and in, in collaboration also with Lille, uh, with the University of Lille. And we isolate the EV from brain patients in directly in the brain and we quantify by NTA and by mass spectrometry the, the different uh, conditions. And as you can see, we don't observe that the tau or the number of vesicule or the size of the vesicule are changed by the pathology, 3R or 4R, because Pig's disease is a 3R pathology and PSP is a 4R pathology. And interestingly, we also develop a strategy by, by proteomic to determine, with, and we use a category of MISEV uh, protein to determine if this uh, this isolation is correct for the EV or for non-associated EV. And as you can see, we mainly enrich the EV with this technique. And we also, by good term, we can uh, validate the fact that we have no difference between pathology and between the, the different condition of EV isolation. So after that, we decide to exactly use the same strategy, but we develop in collaboration with another group in Lausanne, an IPS derived astrocyte and expressing mitotimer, so expressing our sensor for mitochondria. And again, we observe exactly the same consequences, meaning that if you treat with a free air vesicle, you increase the redox states and you reduce the elongation of the mitochondria. But at the opposite, if you treat with a four air EV, we decrease the, uh, the redox states and you increase the filamentation of mitochondria. We have also some unpublished results to suggest that the mitochondrial calcium and ATP are also impacted by the 4R, but it's, it's ongoing results, so I have no time to present today. So just to summarize this part, uh, we demonstrated that this spreading of tau from neuron to astrocyte pass mainly by large vesicule, but more importantly, this, this spreading and this uptake by astrocyte induce different consequences if we talk about free air or four air EV. In particular, the free air tau and use fragmentation and redox states, uh, increase of redox states in astrocyte, and it's the opposite effect in uh, concerning the four air. So just to finish my presentation concerning what is the, the importance of this research for the prediction and the stratification of protein dysregulation in human brain, 
And as you probably know, the diagnostic of brain is very complex for many reasons. The main reason is that we have no access to the brain and it's very difficult to have a biopsy. So for this reason, we have a lot of sort of biomarker uh, in CSF, in blood, uh, but the main problem with the blood is that these proteins are very heterogeneous and we have also the measurement of brain-derived protein in blood is complicated by a number of factors and in particular, the main problem is that uh, the, this protein may be rapidly degraded by blood enzyme. So, of course, many persons uh, believe that the, the solution for the diagnostic is perhaps to use the EV who can cross the BBB because we can observe astrocyte-derived extracellular vesicule in a biofluid. And the solution for this diagnosis is perhaps in the EV because we can protect the content and we can observe the signature of the cell that generates it. So, Based on that, in my lab, we developed different uh, protocols in order to isolate this specific vesicule and in particular to understand correctly the content of this vesicule in the brain, but also in a different biofluid. So we have different pipelines and different platforms in my lab, in particular culture cell, mice model, human patient, where we have different biomen for blood, and we develop different strategy to uh, evaluate and isolate the EV soup where we have different population of EV and we try by IP to isolate astrocyte-derived astrocyte, uh, EV and we uh, develop also different uh, technology to, to investigate the content of this EV. Just one result generated by Jan just here concerning the, 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 the EV content from brain patients. So for that, in collaboration with the Hospital of Lille, we use different uh, condition, uh, different diagnosis of patient, PSP control, PICS, and AD patients. And we isolate the patient from the brain, and we use mass spectrometry analysis to analyze the content of this EV. And very interestingly, we also observe that, we observe that the number of neuronal protein in EV of the brain, depending on the pathology, decrease, as you can see, the number of neuronal protein are significantly decreased in the peak disease, in the PSP and Alzheimer disease. However, the number of protein from astrocyte in EV increased in PSP, peaks, and ADI. Interestingly, if you try to analyze the content of this, the global content of this EV, we can observe that the tau pathology is reflected by an enrichment on mitochondrial protein in the EV from the brain, and the amyloid pathology is reflected by the enrichment of the fatty acid oxidation protein in the EV, suggesting that the signature of EV can reflect the different sort of the pathology and the different pattern of pathology that we have in the patients. So thank you so much for this, uh, for your attention. So I will uh, thank you also for every student of my lab and in particular Valentin, Jeanne and Luca, who are very important for this research. Also thank you for Morvan Collin, where we, uh, it's a co main collaborator in this study and, uh, and Elodie and Romain for the, for the different contribution in this work. And thank you again for your attention. So thank you again for the presentation and thanks to your group for this uh, very interesting work. And I'd like now to invite everybody to um, to just note that you can unmute yourselves now. You can start your video if you'd like to have a discussion with the author team here. Um, and again, uh, please put your comments and questions in the chat box, and then I will I will call on you and I will ask you to unmute yourself and um, and interact with the speakers. So let's start out here with Phil Askenes. Phil, welcome. You have a question about the microglia and astrocytes. Yeah, it's surprising that the microglia are not taking up a lot of tau proteins, I guess. So what's the nature of astrocytes surface specificity compared to other neuronal cells like microglia that they take up uh, uh, these tau proteins? Oh, tau, tau exosomes, sorry. Um, we don't know, in fact. Well, now, we, I'm not sure to understand correctly your question. You, what, what, what my is, question is, what's 
the nature of the surface constituents on astrocytes that there is a rather specific uptake by astrocytes, say, compared to microglia. It's a difficult question, I think, because, you know, we, we can open this discussion about what is EV in a brain, because astrocyte can capt every EV from neurons, microglia, etc., and can secrete it also uh, a result of this EV in a brain. So when, when we talk about the content of this EV, we try to analyze by different protein database uh, to know but we, yeah, we just to explain what is our demo, your approach, we have a content of the EV from astrocytes or from neurons based on the culture cell, okay? Because we can create pure culture of neuron, pure culture of astrocyte, and pure culture of microglia. If you make that and you try to see if you have just protein from neurons in neurons, and we don't talk about exchange of protein, we don't just talk about pure neurons, don't express just neuronal protein. We have also protein that we know are present in the microglia, in a, in a, because what is exactly a specific protein for one subpopulation of cell is difficult to know, you know? Um, so I'm not sure to have a good, a good answer for your question, but regarding the microglia, I don't know if we, 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 we don't investigate the question of the, the nature of the microglial uh, EV. Um, but in the brain, the result that I don't present today, that is the, the I'm not sure that is true, but I, I remember that the number of protein come from microglia you know, EV on isolation is very low. So we have not a lot of protein from microglia you know, after our EV isolation, and we have different protocols by SEG, by ultra centrifugation, compared to the content from astrocytes in our EV. It's, uh, it's very different. I have no other reason for that, but... Uh, I think also one of the reasons we focused more on astrocytes rather than microglia is in our uh, goal to move into the biofluids, especially the blood, it's difficult to argue that we would be isolating uh, EVs that are specific to microglia in the blood uh, when they have proteins that are very similar to the macrophages present in the rest of the body. Um, so for us, it's something we haven't investigated very thoroughly even from the beginning because we sort of knew that this population of EVs wasn't one that we would be able to reliably target in the blood. So we haven't actually even really looked in cell culture at what uh, the involvement is of microglia. If they also take up these EVs and resecrete mm -hmm. tau in some form, um, it's not something we've investigated yet uh, in the lab. My question was not what microglia are lacking. What do astrocytes have that make them specific for uptake of the tau oh. EVs? No, I'm not sure that the astrocyte is specific for the for the uptake. I think probably the microglia make the same job, um, but in the context of of our model, we just evaluate the question from the spreading from neuron to astrocytes, for sure. And we know publications that the, demonstrate that the microglia can also cap the tau protein, and it's perhaps the first wall to this accumulation of the toe in the brain, because the job of microglia is to clean the brain. But the fact is that the astrocytes are everywhere compared to the microglia. For each synapse in your brain, you have one astrocyte, suggesting that the, we, we, don't, we don't believe that the astrocyte is the key for the, for, for the, the cleaning of the brain. We just suggest that the spreading of EV from neuron to astrocyte have a clear consequences on the functioning of astrocytes. And if you impact the astrocyte functioning, you impact the functioning of the brain, you know? So it's, a, it's more in this way that we investigate the question of the, it's the reason why we don't, we, we focus on astrocyte mainly because astrocyte regulates the synapse, regulates the functioning, regulates the glutamate. If you impact on the mitochondrial function on, in astrocytes, you impact in everything. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's good. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question, no. Phil. And I think um, one of the issues that was raised here was the specificity of our markers 
And indeed, um, this leads us into the next question from Rakesh Singh. Rakesh, please go ahead. Yeah, you know, I, I'm also interested in looking at uh, EVs, using EVs as a diagnostic markers of diseases in the central nervous system. And what we are struggling with that, our model is similar to yours, is collecting venous blood and then try to identify EVs that are released from the brain. But to make a consistent um, uh, argument about that, that method is reliable and we can use as a diagnostic marker EVs from the brain, is there a consensus on what percent of total EVs that are circulating in the blood is actually coming from the brain? And how do we know that? Do we have a very specific, I mean, something unique that are only present on the either inside those EVs that are coming from the brain or on the surface that we can take and clearly distinguish between EVs coming from the rest of the body versus EVs coming from the brain? Thank you. Yeah, you can. You can. It's the it's a PhD topic of John, so you can. Yeah. You can start by the answer. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. I, it's a very perfect question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank because, you. Yeah. Um. So it's a question that I'm I'm interested in studying right now for my project as well. Um. The general approach that we've taken so far is that we don't have one marker that is specific to anything that will come out of the brain. Uh, and so we're taking it on a cell type specificity basis. Yeah. So another reason that we focused uh, on astrocytes in the earlier part. Um, for my preliminary work, um, I don't have a percentage for all of the brain material in the, in the blood, but for astrocyte derived material, um, I'm finding between one and 2% of EVs. Yeah. Uh, have markers that can be considered specific to astrocytes. Um, so it's not a lot, uh, definitely. There's a lot of material from obviously the rest of the body, um, but it's something that we're working on enriching by using multiple astrocytic markers at the same time in sort of a cocktail in order to capture the most um, brain relevant material possible from the blood. Yeah. Is there an opportunity I can collaborate and learn more from you guys because I am new to EV biology. My interest is basically in neuropharmacology. That's my training is. But so I'm trying to extend my training to understand better ways, whether we can use this very non-invasive. I mean, everybody donates blood. Like every time you go to clinic, you donate blood. So nobody will complain about donating blood. And mm -hmm. we can use a little bit of that blood and be able to develop a test. Then we can say with confidence that, look, this is what is happening. Yeah, but it's, it's completely true. And you know, it's. I think we can say that we have a, no clear evidence that the EV from the, for me, it's not clear if the EV from secreted in the brain, if you can yeah. find exactly the same signature. And when I talk about signature, I talk about surface signature, but also uh, lumen signature. We don't know if this EV secreted in the brain. Yeah. Has through the cell, through the BBB, and you can obtain exactly the same vesicle in the brain and in the plasma. It's a first yep. question, and we have no answer. For me, we have no answer about that. We try to develop different tools in my lab, and in particular, viral vector to, uh, to target the EV by fluorescence, protein, etc. And John talked about that. We have some uh, some strategy to isolate this EV from um, brain, but we can also consider a very important point that the brain is large. The yeah. brain is the vasculature of the brain and is perhaps different in the prefrontal cortex and in the hippocampus. So if you if you isolate basically in the plasma, could you talk about EV from one region or all region? You know, yeah. so we can imagine also that the topographical aspect is yeah. very important. For the for the biomarker um, strategy, so mm -hmm. I think it's the reason why it's very important. And for me, it's the beginning of science of EV in the brain. We perhaps start by different publications that suggest that only one candidate permit to isolate the EV in a plasma. For me, it's not completely true. Perhaps a cocktail of of yeah. antibody. Uh, it's more important for isolation of the specific region of the brain, specific subpopulation of the brain. But perhaps the more important point is to know what sort of EV cross, what sort of EV, uh, large EV, small EV, uh, yeah. no, 
KV, astrocytic KV, and we don't know. We just suppose that the astrocyte is very, very near to the vessel and perhaps is a good candidate for yeah. biomarker. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'm going to leave my email in the messaging and uh, in the chat. And if we can send me your contacts, we can collaborate and talk about that. I have something to offer as well, just in case all the EV biology folks out there who are interested in examining the cargo of EVs without destroying them like lysis and all that. So in live and intact EVs, you can examine what they're actually carrying. And that's the one way I'm trying to identify which is coming from brain versus the rest of the body. There are certain specific brain proteins. And if the EV is coming from brain, more or less likely that they will have those protein. And without destroying EV, maintaining their surface integrity and looking at surface marker that's associated with brain or central nervous system, and then correlating that with what they contain inside, that's my approach of trying to, you know, very specifically, I mean, it's not going to be very specific, but at least close to a specific uh, clarifying about what is coming from brain versus what coming from rest of the body. Yeah, completely. Yeah, I think it's very important. Thank you so much. Yeah, lots and lots of uh, very interesting questions here. I think um, if you look at the literature, the estimates of the percentage of EVs in the blood that have come from uh, from the brain have ranged anywhere from approximately zero all the way to ten to fifteen percent. You know, so it's this huge, huge gap. Yeah. Um, between the, the the minimum and the maximum that have been reported. And where this gap comes from is really from the tools that we use, right? I mean, so what is the specificity of the antibodies? Yeah. Um, so even if we do have a perfect marker for a neuronal or an astrocyte central nervous system, let's not forget about the peripheral nervous system either, um, EV, then is is the antibody that we're using 100% 100 specific to that marker or or yeah. as most you know for most antibodies even monoclonal antibodies it, it is going to have a certain affinity for several other proteins that are out there so so lots and lots of um of considerations here i know i see that um susan goals has said one to two percent astrocyte evs and blood seems to be high you know but i i like that approach of um you know maybe using multiple markers um and and it's certainly it's something that, that that we're doing in my group um to try to cast the net wide so it does yeah. depend on your final question if you need the specificity or rather if you're trying to get a signal and you're willing to take some some background along with it so thanks so much for the question um let's go to next to uh christina coylan who asks about the separation method that you're using for your evs um, so I, I, um, can, can you, can you just make a few comments about how, how you are separating your EVs and Christina, yeah. feel free to jump on if, um, if, if the, you need a follow up. So in our, um, on our mass spectrometry, uh, analysis cohort, we're using size exclusion chromatography. So, um, we are not using any ultra centrifugation, just, um, basic centrifugation to, to take out the larger debris and then directly into size exclusion chromatography uh, columns. Um, and so a fairly yeah, straightforward protocol, but we're not relying on, on ultra centrifugation or density gradient at this moment. Yeah, but perhaps just we can explain that for the brain isolation, we have not exactly the same protocol for culture cell yeah. and brain. Of course, because the quantity of the cell is not the same. And also because um, we also, for the question of the biomarker and for the brain-derived EV, we also use a recent protocol of Palenco and um, what is the protocol we, we uh, combine Vela. different? Yeah, Vela and Palenco. We we merge. We combine two protocols. Suggest that we can use papain or collagen free to digest the tissue slowly, and um, and after we isolate the EV from this digestion, and it's a reason why also we try um, we we develop this strategy of mass spectrometry and this annotation system with a MISEV protein. So we use a guideline of MISEV to know what what is the protein by proteomics that we obtain or that we uh, 
yeah, that is necessary to obtain to know we talk about EV or we talk about contaminant of, of EV. And I don't present today, but we have also other experiments where it's not successful and we have more protein in the contaminant EV. So this strategy worked very well, I think, and proteomic is a very now I think because proteomic in, in, increase the, the, the platform increase everywhere, I think it's also a very good strategy to to characterize and to evaluate the quality control of EV by proteomic approach compared to stem blood, where is sometimes, and we can discuss about that, sometimes it's very difficult to see some protein uh, in Western blood in our, in our sample. So um, the proteomic approach for us is a very, is a solution to qualify and quantify the EV, not quantify, but qualify the quality of the EV. So, and it's the reason why I'm very, you know, I trust about this system of isolation by SEC. So we use a yeah, classical simplification SEC. And after we can just mention that if you just use SEC, the problem with a, with a size exclusion chromatography is you dilute your sample yeah. by four in general. And so um, we can just exist different protocol in particular for proteomic where you can um, um, concentrate your protein uh, or concentrate your EV after sec. And it's worked very well for the proteomic approach. So you can, um, you can also use this strategy. I try to sell my, my, my approach for proteomic because I think it's, uh, for me, the future of the analysis of, the, of this EV. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, and thank you for that. The additional question I had was more the specific markers, but obviously that's something that you're still optimizing and, and deciding on what cocktail. Um, I'm doing a similar work and similar projects, and I'm using mass spec as well. Um, what I'm concerned about as I'm pulling all of the information that we've gathered together is by the very nature of exosomes and extracellular vesicles as being dynamic in terms of the cargo that they carry. Um, you know, if we put out something that's neuronal or astrocytic or microglial, it, especially in the case of say astrocytes or microglia, if they're activated or if there's an immune response, like how do we allow for those changes that are obviously gonna happen in the cargo that is loaded if you're an activated astrocyte versus non-activated and you know you're not always going to express the same yeah. surface mm -hmm. proteins you know that's that's my concern as i pull this together so i'm very cautiously making conclusions about what we can say um with the data the, that um I've yeah, i completely agree with you it's uh it's very difficult for us to know if it just because the ev contact the um, um, contact the, the, the astrocyte and activate the astrocyte or because he uh, loads the, 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 the material in, in astrocytes for sure. But we we also try to develop, but it's it's complex question because it's a live imaging where you try to lab. So we try, but it's uh, it's also very, very fast and very surprised about that is uh, is very, very fast. The, 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 the imagination, the capture of this EV if you plus the, the EV in the medium, the, the capture by astrocyte is very fast and it's very difficult for us to, to follow something because we talk about also uh, super resolution system, confocal, etc. So it's a, it's a very complex question for perhaps a small question. I don't know if we can say that, but uh, it's... Right. Uh, yeah, so, but I think it, for sure it's very important to, to yeah, to be careful. In, in this publication, we suggest that this, we treat by EV and we try to suggest that we, this EV have different, depending on the nature of this EV, we can observe different nature of answer by astrocytes. So I think it's also very important for the biology, suggest that same protein, oh, perhaps it's not tau protein, it's also another problem. Perhaps in the EV from free air and for air, we have other, candidates who can activate the process. We, we don't know if it's just Tau who makes this, this, this answer, you know, but after the, the, the conclusion is, if you have different population of astrocytes from different pathology or topathy, you have different answers by astrocytes. And in particular, if you have free air neurons, 
the consequences is very deleterious for astrocytes because the functioning of astrocytes when the mitochondria is fragmented and without mobility is very difficult to react and to activate something like astrocytes, in particular to regulate the synapse, etc. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm agree with you. The, the conclusion is not that the content of EV induce this disorder, for sure. Yeah, and, and the fact that, you know, at least by mass spec, we're seeing a lot of, you know, FC binding regions on exosomes, we're seeing immunoglobulins, like it comes back to your concern about how do we Western block, but then also how do we control? How do we, you know, we use mouse IgG as control, but if your exosome is littered with the ability to bind certain IgGs, then how do we say what's the background? You know, so these are things I'm wrestling with myself. So this is a very timely talk and very interesting. So thank you very much no, for your work. You. I'll let you. someone else talk. So I don't, I don't, um, I don't mean to put anybody on the spot here, but I noticed that Efrat Levy is on the call, and so Efrat was um, really pioneered the uh, brain-derived EV isolation separation protocol so um Efrat, if you're if you're um if you're able to turn on your your uh, microphone i'm wondering if you might comment on this question of what do we know about how disease and how pa pathologic processes are affecting the evs that are actually in the brain tissue um, based upon how the cells are are, are responding and, and forging these kinds of different environments yeah, so uh, that a long answer uh, possible. We are, we have been isolating EVs from the uh, brain extracellular space of both the uh, mice and uh, human, and uh, we developed a method that I that separate between different types of EVs, so different subtypes of exosome, microvesicles, and then we found these uh, specific vesicles that are of mitochondria origin. And uh, they are very, very separate, the mitochondria derived vesicle from the others. And we found that when there is an endosomal isosomal pathology, like in Alzheimer's disease, Down syndrome, and many other disorders, there are more vesicles that are released into the exocellular space, and uh, they contain different uh, proteins. So there are huge differences in the content of uh, the ex mainly exosomes, but also mitochondria, uh, mitochondria derived vesicles. We'll try to figure out uh, the number of this. Ah, so also if they have mitochondrial dysfunction, there are more uh, mitochondrial derived uh, vesicles that we call mitovesicles. Uh, we try to figure out the source of the vesicles, and for exosomes, it's very difficult, but for Mitovesicles, it's much easier because they have, uh, in the brain, they have Mao A and Mao B that are set, expressed by different cells. So Mao A is neuronal and Mao B is uh, astrocytic. And we find that there are many more astrocytic derived mitovesicles than neurons. But it makes kind of makes sense because there are many more astrocytes compared to, to neurons in the brain especially the mouth derived the neurons. And it's a, it's a normal mechanism to, to secrete the astrocytes or it's just because you use a, you use brain for that or, or in control brain, you have also secretion of mito uh, vesicule, as you say, or? Yeah, it's a, okay. it's, a, it's a normal process. I would guess that all cells uh, secrete it uh, because we find in vitro when we use fibroblasts from uh, Down syndrome patients, you can okay. find uh, mitochondrial derived uh, vesicles, not the vesicle, we don't isolate them from the medium because the amount of uh, EV that you can get is very low, but we find mitochondria the proteins in EVs, in small and, EVs. Just, sorry, you find protein from mitochondria or you find mitochondria in EV? Because, um, you know, it's difficult to know if you have a residue of mitochondria digest by the system of agosome, etc., and address in the EV and the NVB and so extracted, or you find uh, all or, or, or functional mitochondria in your EV. So we, we are able to isolate the mitovesicles from brain because you can get large amount. 
the percent of uh, mitovesicles from uh, general uh, EVs is very low. So to get it from media will be very difficult. But from the brain, we specifically isolate this mitovesicle. So I am not a person that uh, it's uh, black and or white. I would think that there are many ways for uh, release of uh, mitochondrial derived uh, content. So the mitovesicle have also mitochondria, uh, RNA and DNA and lipids and, and proteins, of course. So, but not all of them, and they are functional. They produce a ATP and they yeah. affect uh, synapses in the in the hippocampal slices. So mm -hmm. they are they are functional, the mitovesicles. I can I would guess they are secreted by all cells, but I cannot uh, prove it at, at this time. I would like to, but uh, but we can discuss because we have perhaps tools for or we can share some some data. I'm, I'm very curious about the, the the protocol for the isolation of mitochondrial vesicle compared to the other because um yeah um we 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 try but in the past we try because in the initial protocol for the EV, the main problem is that you have also mitochondria, but in particular with UC, with ultra centrifugation, the you have a clear pollution by mitochondria. So we develop, we try to develop also a system where we depleted the mitochondria from the EV fraction, but it's it's difficult for if we use for every set of data. Uh, but for sure, we decrease the number of proteins that we have in you in the fraction of EV. So, so I think also it's. Uh, I'm very curious about your protocol and to share your protocol if it's possible to know what is a, uh, what is uh, if we can yeah if we can know because as I explained in my last slides we have a lot of uh, biomarker from mitochondria, in particular um, depending of the progression of the of the level of the pathology. If we try to correlate the different level of the pathology, the, 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 the yeah, how we can say that, it's, it's, it's very reflect by the quantity of protein in the EV from mitochondria. Yeah, this is great Great to see this discussion here. And thank you for sharing your um, your experience, Efrat. Um, I just want to uh, mention yeah, that yeah. Pasquale Dacuzzo is, is the one that they developed the, the method. He and we'll send you uh, Pasquale protocol. is on here too. So yeah, yeah. okay. So we'll, <laughs> we'll get some, we'll get some, uh, some protocols so, around. Yeah, good, good. Perfect. Well, you know, this this uh, topic of the mitochondria, too, leads us right into the next question, which is from uh, Kathleen Borgman. Kathleen, please go ahead. What Kathleen is asking is mitochondrial turnover by autophagy is impaired by large mitochondrial size. So does this, uh, what, what you're describing for tau, suggest an alternate, or alternative mechanism for mitochondrial turnover? Maybe I can answer this one. Yeah. Um, so first of, first of all, I'd say that it's hard to talk about the turnover and its real nature based on metotimer. It gives a wide window of what's happening. Is it accelerating with more new mitochondrial protein or less? Because it's green and after a certain time, they will switch to red or under very oxidized conditions. So when you see the cells, so the ratio switching to a greener state, let's say, it can be caused by either a reduction of the red intensity we observe, or by an increase of the green um, intensities. The first one would mean there is more uh, degradation of mitochondrial protein, and in the second case, more biogenesis. So with the same observation, there could be two explanations. And so we need to look at the individual uh, fluorescences that we have, the green and the red. So in this case, I cannot uh, tell completely uh, by memory if it was a green change or red change because of how we, we summarize the result. But our maybe 4R is doing something on the degradation side or on the biogenesis side. Uh, however, for the moment, we haven't studied this yet and we need some, um, some um, more developed strategies to really understand uh, the mechanisms that are happening um, in the middle. So. Yeah, it's a very good question, by the way, because it also enables to develop a bit more how this meter timer is working and what you can um, 
uh, conclude from it. Thanks, Valentin, for that um, for that response. Um, Susan Goals, a question about the, the size of these EVs. Susan, are you on? I am, and I'm just trying Hi. to figure out how to. Uh, perfect. Okay, we see you. Hi. So, um, yeah. So, in your with your condition media, you drew the conclusion that the large EVs were better, were the, the more important in res with respect to um, transferring tau. But I wonder, my impression is, is that when you isolate total EVs, that, that the small EVs constitute a much higher percentage, that like 90% are little and 10% are big. And so when you look at the overall, even if the larger EVs, you know, one larger EV is more efficient than one small EV, when you look overall, do you think that the small EVs are just as important or even more so because there's so many more of the small EVs um, in vivo? Does that make sense at all? Yeah, it's a uh, it's a good it's a very, very good question. It's a very good question. Yeah, because yeah, we can yeah, you 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 can try. Right? <laughs> I can I can I, I have my answer, but you can try. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily uh, I don't know backed up by by literature, but my impression about the transfer of tau in the context of pathology. Um, and my hypothesis based off of, of the results that we've obtained is that maybe the large EVs are more important in the clearing uh, mechanisms of these inclusions, whereas the small EVs may be more uh, in a signaling um, capacity. So maybe the larger EVs are kind of used in the, in the shedding of debris from these cells, and maybe that's why we see more transfer by these large EVs um, because maybe their job is more to get rid of this debris from from cells and and astrocytes and microglia are the cells that are most likely to take up those large EVs in order to manage um, that kind of a mechanism. But uh, yeah, as far as the, we still see tau in the small EVs. And so, yeah, it's a good question about if the number of small EVs can kind of outweigh the the quantity of tau in the fewer large uh, EVs? It's a very difficult question and because how we can normalize? Because the size, <laughs> the size is bigger, so the quantity is bigger. You have a big bag and a small bag, so mm -hmm. you can consider that in a big bag you can put more thing, you know? So, and we can, when we quantify the tau by immunogold, I don't know if you remember my pictures, but yep. we, we just find one dot in a small one and five dots in a big one. It's not just a, a caricature of something, it's, it's a reality. We find a lot of dots of toe in, in a large vesicle and not in a small. After, of course, we consider when we submit the paper to, you know, to normalize by something, by the size of the vesicle, by the, but because we are not in a black and white science with the EV, it's difficult to know what is the size of this EV because we are, we talked about the fractioning. We have, a, we have an enrichment of the large EV, but we know that in the small, in a large fraction, we have also small fraction of EV. We know that. But I, I really like, I hadn't even thought of it, but I think it's a really interesting concept that maybe the large EVs are getting rid of the tau and maybe it's the small EVs that actually transfer the tau or something like that. Yeah, I think that that's kind of an interesting concept um, that, and it kind of would make sense that the bio, you know, that the, the biogenesis is somewhat different. I, I, I think that that's sort of a really an interesting idea. Yeah, it's very good. It's, I, I don't know. I'm I'm not expert about the difference between large and small, even if we just finish this paper. But I don't know if the the make I know well the mechanism of of secretion that we know the difference of the secretion mechanism between large and small. But concerning the uptake of this EV, I don't know if we know. For sure, in the brain, we don't know if the, the, the pathway used is very different, in particular to load material or not. So, so I don't know. Perhaps one person has an answer about that in, the, in here, but I don't know if we can know 
what sort of material are delivery in the recipient cell by uh, small and large. But it's a very interesting question, I think. But in particular for the question of the spreading of material. Yeah. Um, thank you. Great, okay, we have a couple more questions here we'll try to get through. Um, Kira, Kira DeForni. Yes, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I was also thinking about indeed how, uh, yeah, what is this this relation between the soluble tau that's, that's not being transferred and the tau being transferred via the EVs? So a bit of a, a technical question, because uh, you detect your tau in your EVs by ELISA, and I was wondering, are you in this essay detecting surface-bound tau, or are you really detecting uh, tau that's also in your vesicle? So have, do you have, is there really license of your e, uh, EVs in these type of, of tau detection strategies? Just to get a sense of, yeah, is it is it would tau bound to the outside of UV also give it a pathological effect? Uh, is it yeah, enough uh, for uptake? Uh, yeah, it's a, we are, so I, I don't talk about the, this uh, because we use two strategies to evaluate the quantity of tau in astrocyte. The first and the more quantitative is the ELISA. And for ELISA, we wash the cell. So we, we wash by PBS uh, three times. And after we use the ELISA. So we can consider that it's mainly in or stick in the membrane, okay? But in the parallel, we also use immunochemistry, uh, again, immuno, immunofluorescence, to see where the vesicles are positive for tau. And with these sort of pictures, we can see that the EV, because you know, when you have immunofluorescence uh, essay, uh, you wash, you see everything. So we can, we can consider that the material are inside, because I have not the real proof because the real proof is just by electronic microscopy for that or super resolution because it, the, the cell is not. But we have we have vesicule, red vesicule, so red is positive for tau uh, in the cell, so not mainly in the surface of the membrane. But again, we are not completely sure that is not black and white. Perhaps we have on the surface and inside, but one day after the transfer of vesicule, if you wash, you fix with PFA, you use antibody against tau, you can observe uh, tau in a sort of small vesicule of tau, positive vesicule of tau in astrocytes. But uh, yeah, yeah. No, so, I, was, I was more wondering on the EV themselves, not really like in the astrocyte, but already uh, just the EV. So is there ah, is yeah. there a tau bound to the outside of EVs? And if you add EVs and tau to a cell together, a soluble form, does it also enhance tau uptake and response by cells? We see every configuration, in fact. We see everything. We see tau inside, we see tau outside, uh, on the surface. By electronic microscopy, we have no clear pattern about that. So I think it's... Uh, so the conclusion of today and the conclusion of the EV is not black and white. And so I think it's uh, we, we we don't quantify uh, the amount of tau protein in or in the surface in the vesicle, etc. But for sure, it's uh, difficult to investigate this question. Also, perhaps it's a it's a project of PhD uh, for one year to to investigate this question uh, for sure because. We, we can imagine to digest the EV by protein NASCAR to know if you decrease the, the, the amount of tau. And we, we use this strategy in the previous publication um, and we keep tau inside. So if you digest the vesicle by protein NASCAR and you quantify by ELISA before and after in two sort of relation, you keep tau in, in the ELISA essay, okay? But you decrease uh, a, a mold of tau, because perhaps in your in, in your surface you have also some part of tau. And another point that I can just um, uh, propose that is also the ELISA or the um, the ELISA and also the immunochemistry work with antibody. Antibody detect epitope, and so it's also the big problem because we use one epitope from one part of tau because we use monoclonal to antibody to detect one part, but perhaps we don't detect this part of tau, but we have another peptide of tau in this, uh, in this vesicle. Because in the context of vesicle, we can imagine we, we are not in a proteome, proteome cell, 
we talk about peptide of MIC, uh, we, it's a, we, we talk about peptide in EV, probably more peptide from protein in a human compared to, compared to the, uh, that we can find in the cytoplasm. So I think it's a very complex question to, to know what, uh, but yeah, it's, I think it's very interesting. I remember one publication we investigate that. So if you are interested, I can send you, uh, but for sure you don't separate the large and the small EV. So for sure. Yeah, and there's a, um, a comment from Stephanie Fowler, and she just had a nice uh, preprint that was put up on detection of tau um, in large extracellular vesicles by cryo EM. So thanks for sharing that link, Stephanie. And um, and we see Phil Askenes is also encouraging us to remember that astrocyte EV, astrocyte EVs can also influence microglia that can release EVs. So it's uh, important to keep that in mind too. Um, final question, if you can just stick around for a couple more minutes, is that all right? Yeah. Yeah, good, good. Okay, so um, that is from Nilufar Ali. Nilufar, please uh, please go ahead if you're if you're on. Um, uh, can you guys hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Hi. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, my question was like, uh, I did not go through the paper, but now I do, that the BDF fro was from the postmortem sample and you have your own method of isolating EVs from brain derived uh, fluid. So is it in short, you are just uh, like um, isolating the tissue from postmodern brain and then um, passing it through uh, methods of just uh, decellularizing it and then isolating EVs from it and uh, separating through sec, right? Yeah, so this is, um, we do the, we don't do any mechanical um, separation uh, to try to minimize cell lysis. So we just do a, a gentle digestion with a, either papain or collagenase 3 in order to sort of dissociate the tissue without rupturing the cells. Uh, and then we're able to take the liquid that contains the, the EVs released from the, the extracellular uh, matrix area. Um, and then that's what we pass. Yeah, we, we do some centrifugations to remove the larger debris and then directly onto size of solution chromatography. Okay. so. Just to make clear, you don't have any EVs that are isolated from inside the cells, like. So yeah, I mean, theoretically, we like to to say that we don't, but I mean, of course, there's going to be some cell lysis in our protocol. Um, it's not; it's inevitable to have a bit of of contaminating uh, intracellular material, but that's sort of what we use um, the proteomics um, quality control check to verify that that we don't have a large contamination of intracellular material. Um, but yeah, it's it's still difficult to prove uh, today with the tools that we have that we're working really exclusively with extracellular vesicles and that no vesicles in our population are released from the cell during the lysis process. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, there's also like, I don't know if you guys know that, but uh, there's also a group of EVs which are called ECM derived EVs, like extracellular matrix derived EVs. So do you think that these are the EVs you are looking at. Mm. Essentially, you are, but I, I'm not sure that the protocol you follow. Yeah, can can you same. clarify what what do you mean by extracellular matrix derived EVs? Are so, these you're saying EVs that are have bound to the extracellular matrix? Yes, yes. There are a couple of papers when uh, so I I'm at Boise State. So here there's an extracellular matrix core. And uh, this core uh, looks at majorly at the EV, at the extracellular matrix derived, you know, all the other pathologies or uh, uh, techniques and all. So I, I'm look, I'm trying to look at, um, trying to um, make a protocol for EVs derived from ECM. And there are uh, published protocols for uh, exosomes derived from extracellular matrix. So they are just taking the ECM and then isolating the EVs from whatever uh, EV sources are in the ECM. So I I may share the link, uh, I, don't, I don't have time, but um, I may share it to Ken and then you can forward it. But yeah, maybe that is important uh, to see if the protocols match or what we are looking at. Um, also, the other question was, do you have, uh, have you looked at the CSF uh, and found the same? Like EV is uh, having tau or mitochondrial proteins in the CSF. No, we don't check. Uh, we don't check CSF, um, which because we we start in the CSF, but isolate EV in the CSF is not easy. 
for many reasons that I think that the population of EV is not very abundant in the CSF, in our hand in particular. And also the protocol we test in collaboration with a different group, a different protocol like UC, SEC, Gradient of Sutras, etc. And we, it's difficult to detect something in this EV. I don't know why. Um, and also, it's um, compared to the plasma, and now my lab work mainly in the plasma biomarker. Um, it's also very complex to obtain, in particular in the control patients. Uh, because if I propose to have a punctal lumbar for the research, is in our hand is very difficult to have the CSF for the control. So if you want to control something, it's better to have a control. And in our hand, we have no CSF of control. So it's a reason why we 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 don't uh, investigate this question also. Well, and there is an entire task force for CSF within ISEV. So um, we're probably going to be hearing more from them it is indeed a difficult fluid to work with it's practically water uh, yeah. everything is normal yeah, <laughs> but, um, because it's a sort of filter <laughs> you know it's a filter perhaps the EV don't pass correctly this filter yeah. Um, yeah and i think the last question is uh, uh covered by uh dr uh efrat and all it was really intriguing to like get the knowledge of uh, mito evs and it's very it's it's complicated and it's a new field. Uh, but are you like in your method? Did you see that the most of the transfer of tau or mitochondria was through the large EVs? And did you like uh, deselect the, any other method that was operating, like nanotubes or um, other method of <laughs> transfer? No, in our hand, we don't use nanotube. Uh... An, an nanotube experiments. We, we don't observe uh, uh, more than yes, I think more than sees that exist the spreading from. Um, I, I remember some publication that explain that the toe can spread by nanotube for sure. And a recent paper also published by uh, Haneka uh, suggests that the microglia can also transfer. Uh, sorry, the micro microglia can transfer mitochondria by nanotube in the context of disease. So we know exists a sort of transfer of mitochondria from one cell to another by other approach. But uh, in the in the in our lab, we don't investigate this question. We I think EV it's in us for 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 the moment. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yes, I think it's very interesting. After it's very difficult to know if the nanotube exists in the reality, so in the brain, because it's just published in a, in a. I, I don't remember a proof of concept for nanotube exists in a brain uh, and transfer a real material in a physiological condition. So perhaps in a condition of stroke or perhaps in a, during dementia, we can have this sort of of mechanism, but I don't know if we can prove in a, in a human brain, it's very difficult to obtain this proof. Well, on that, on that note, um, and with that big question, um, we will conclude for today. I'd like to thank everybody for joining and for all of the great questions and discussion points. Uh, but most of all, thank you. Thank you, Kevin, uh, Jean, Valentin, um, for, your, um, for your contributions here and for sharing this work with us today. Um, we wish you the best as you continue it as well, and we'll look forward to, uh, to what comes out of the lab next. So thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great rest of the week, and see you again on an EV Club very soon.